All right, we're going to go ahead and start. We just want to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night Bible studies. And um, we're going to continue on the fruit of the Spirit, so we're going to continue on love. But we're going to open up in a word of prayer, first of all. Father, we thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing. I pray, my God, that I will step aside and that you would use me to teach your word, to encourage us, inspire us, my God, that we can learn, God, to love the way you love, Father. And God, I pray right now, God, that we come against distractions right now, God, and our minds will be open and sensitive to your Holy Spirit, Father. And we're careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. So we started on the fruit of the Spirit, and we're on love right now. And we're, last week we brought out the eros love, meant the erotic, sensual love, the selfish love. Um, and then today we're going to look at the second word on your handout there. It says the second word for love is the Greek word sturgo, S-T-E-R-G-O. Again, we just want to thank those that are watching on YouTube, amen, also. Amen. And if you would like the notes, you can go ahead and make a comment in the bottom and, and we can send you uh, the papers that we fill out here. It said here, the word sturgo primarily pictures the love that exists between parents and children. So when it's talking about sturgo love, it's talking about the parents and the child. The next bullet is talking about members of a family. You know, uh, uh, that you're here, this is family, I love you, amen. Uh, it says, it is very rarely used. We find it used in a negative sense in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. It says, where the King James Version translates it without natural affection. This suggests a time that will develop in the last days when strong family ties and devotions to one's family will deteriorate. By using this word in a negative sense, the Apostle Paul warns that one of the principal signs of the last times will be the, then there's two bullets, deterioration of the family. And how many know we see that right now, deterioration of the family? I mean, before, remember, you could sit down, eat a dinner, the whole family there, and not, all the attention focus there. Now you, you sit on a table, everybody's on the phone, and everybody's doing everything else. And, and so we already see the deterioration of the family. The second one is, and the family values. And the family values. Remember, priority was values before. We, we value family. And, and now sometimes people don't value family no more. You know, uh, they're stuck on their phones or, or, or they don't know what it is to, to, to work together as a family, to sit down on the table and eat together, you know, uh, uh, and just stay there and have a conversation. That's lost nowadays. You know, it was there. I remember my mom, it was always there with them. We always sat down. There was always a, wooden, a warm meal. And, you know, we, we gave our attention there. Nowadays, you know, the culture, it's not there. Now it goes on and it says the third word for love is the Greek word phileo. P-H-I-L-E-O. Phileo. It says this word describes affection. It carries the idea of two or more people who feel compatible, well-matched, well-suited, and complementary to each other. Although this word describes the attributes of friendship, it is not representative of the highest form of love, which is agape. So it says it refers to brotherly, brotherly love and is most often exhibited in a close friendship. Now, this is not family. This is like brother, sister in the Lord kind of love, and, and, and it shows through a close friendship, you know, that's my brother, that's my sister in Christ, and then the handout says, best friends will display this generous and affectionate love for each other as each seeks to make the other happy. The scriptural account of David and Jonathan is an excellent illustration of phileo love, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 1 through 3, it says, when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bonded to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Verse 2, so Saul took David that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him 
as himself. This, this is the, the love that is talking about, the phileo love, a strong bond. And, and how many know that when Jonathan, if you understand that story, Jonathan was next in line to be king because his dad Saul was the king and it would, should have went to Jonathan. But when Jonathan met David, he had a love for him where he served David knowing that God's hand was on David's life. And how many know that that's, that's a big step to say, uh, I deserve this. My right is to be king. But God, your hand is on David, so I'm going to just serve David and build a bond with him. Amen. That way you can do what you want to do. And, and sometimes that's hard for us, you know, to serve under people and, and, and because we think that we have the privilege or we want better. And sometimes we get, we, we get it all twisted up. And then it says the, first, the fourth word for love is the word chiefly used in the New Testament to depict the love of God. This is the Greek word for agape, agape love. And, 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 and as long as we're saved, this is what we strive, amen, for the love of God, the agape love. And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, how little you've been saved. We're all growing to love like God. Uh, uh, I've been serving the Lord 42 years, and I'm still learning how to love like God, that agape love. Because how many know our feelings get in the way? Somebody get us mad, what do you want to do? Right away, you know. But the agape love says, don't do that. The agape love says, love like God loves. Especially nowadays, if we want to win people over to Christ, we have to show the agape love. Because, you, I mean, if you look at the news, the only time they show Christians are, are like those weird ones, you know, uh, uh, doing something dumb or, or something crazy, and they give us a bad name. But if, imagine if every believer can walk around with the agape love. It's the love that will draw them to Christ, amen, because it's the only love that comes from God. It says, it is this word that Paul uses in Galatians 5.22 when he writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what I call high-level love, for there is no higher, finer, or more excellent love than the agape love. It says agape occurs when an individual sees, recognizes, understands, or appreciates the value of an object or person, causing the viewer to behold this object or person in the great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. When we have the agape love, then we're going to look at those that God puts before us like, wow, God, you know. You put them before me. That goes for the men of God in our lives, the women of God in our lives, people that come in and touch us at different seasons in our life that, that we have an agape love like, man, God, you brought them into my life. Because when we have agape love, we're going to be able to receive correction from them. When we don't have agape love, we're just going to want uh, 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 encouragement all the time and encouragement all the time. But the word of God says that, that it, it, it corrects, it uplifts. Amen. And, and, and sometimes we, we don't like that. I have a phrase where a lot of times where I say that when you don't have agape love, you fall in love with your pastor's hand, not his heart. Meaning, give me, give me, give me. That's falling in love with his hand. But when you fall in love with this heart, you understand, God, you brought us here for a reason. Our whole purpose here is that we can live our best life, not for ourselves. That way we can reach others with the agape love. Because there's other people that only you can reach. I can't reach the type of people or different people that only you can reach. And when we understand that, we're going to say, God, you saved me. Not for I can say, give me, give me, give me. But for I can say, God, use me to change other people's lives. That's agape love. And then it says on the handout in the New Testament, perhaps the best example of agape is found in John 3, 16. And we all know that scripture. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Amen. And, and so, I mean, you can just preach a message on this. Just so God so loved the world. What moved him? Agape love is action. That's agape love. It's action. It says that he loved the world. So what did he do? He gave his only son. So he knows what it is to sacrifice his son, to lose a loved one. He knows what that is. If you're here and you say, man, I lost a loved one. He knows. He, he can feel with you because he did it. He gave his only son, his one and only son, amen, that we can have everlasting life. And it says not only that, then he says that whoever believes in him 
should not perish. And then what did his son do? His son came and what gave his life for you and for me. So God gave 100%. His son gave 100%. That's a God be love. So why wouldn't he require 100% from us? 99.9% .9 is still not 100%. And when we understand that, we're going to say, God, I can't help, God, but give you my life, God, because you're the one that saved me. He's the one that restored my mind. He's the one that pulled us out of the pit. He's the one that put our family back together. He's the one that saves our kids and our children. He's the one that covers us. Amen. And when we understand that, we're like, wow, God, your love is, is I mean, because we're still learning about God's love. Let's put it that way. Because the only love we know is the love that was given to us I mean, from our fathers, our grandparents, and this and that. And sometimes their love was conditional. When we did good, we got rewarded. That's conditional. God's love is unconditional. The Bible says that even at our worst, His love will not change for you and for me. That's good news for us. That man, Because sometimes the flesh and the enemy will tell you, hey, you made a mistake. You're no good. God can't use you. God's love says, hey, I love you in spite of what you're doing because I know what you're doing today. I know what you did yesterday. I know what you're going to do in the future. And none of that can change my love for you. That's agape love. I mean, we should be encouraged, man, that God, you love us with the love that, man, we're still learning how that love feels. Because we're conditioned from the world that, okay, if I make a mistake, I'm going to be punished. And God is saying, no, my grace and mercy is here at this time. And when we understand God's love, we're going to say, we're not going to use the grace and mercy to keep sinning. We're going to say, God, your grace and mercy, man, when, when I didn't deserve none of this, you gave me everything you had. And because you gave me everything you had, I'm grateful, God, I don't want to sin no more. Remember, as long as we're in this flesh, when we first started this series, we talked about the flesh and the spirit fighting each other. The flesh wants to do what it wants to do. And remember, we said, how do you know it's the flesh? Because the flesh always responds an impulse. An impulse. When somebody cuts you off, what does the flesh say? Flip them off. Cuss them out. That's impulse. The, the, the spirit always moves with the word of God. And, and the flesh likes instant gratification. That's right, I told them off. Somebody had to tell them off. And when we stand on the word of God, we don't get results till down the road. That's why sometimes we don't like it. You know, God, I don't see nothing right now. He said, no, it's a process. Stand on my word and I'm building your faith. And so it says, in other words, God's love drove him, drove him to action. Agape is a love that loves so profoundly that it, the bullet there, knows no limits. God's love knows no limits. Doesn't matter what you do, his love for you is not going to change. Then the next bullet, uh, uh, agape love that loves so profoundly that it knows no boundaries. It not only knows no limits, it knows no boundaries in how far it will go to show its love. No boundaries. They don't know any boundaries. God, we can do something and say, man, I made a mistake. And God's love is there. Say, well, just come back. Just repent. Go forward. That's God's love. It has no boundaries. Nothing you can do today, tomorrow, or next year will change God's love for you. I mean, when you hear it like that, that's kind of like baffles our mind. It's like, what do you mean? Uh, no, that's not true. Yes, it is true. God's love will not change. Then on your handout, it says, if necessary... Agape love will even sacrifice itself for the sake of that person it loves. Sacrifice, right? When you love somebody and, and you say, okay, I got that little love, a little bit agape, and then I'll die for them, right? You're like that with your children. Ain't nobody going to get around my kids, especially mama. As they turn into that mama bear, like, what? You know, and, and what are you saying? That you, that's a protecting love, you know? It's a, it'll sacrifice for the sake of the person it loves, then it says, agape is the highest form of love, a self-sacrificial type of love that moves the person to action, moves the person to action. It's almost like when we say, God, I love you, what's going to happen? We're going to change. We're going to move into action. We're going to let the old person die. We're going to put on the new man, amen, the, the new thinking, renewing our mind and say, God, uh, uh, I'm taking action because I love you and I don't want to do what I used to do because I know that hurts you. That hurts your spirit, God. So there has to be change. If there's no change, I mean, we heard that phrase in the world, right? Talk is cheap, right? We heard that, like, talk is cheap. Oh, you say you love me or you say you're sorry. Again, 
How many times you got to say sorry? Where's the action at? You know, and, and so that's what agape love means. There's change. That means that you're going to change. It says in contrast, eros love is self-seeking love. Eros love. You're just looking to fulfill your desires. That's eros love. It's self-seeking love. Sturgill love is limited only to one's family. That's Sturgill love, like my family, my kids, you know. It's limited to only one's family. Phileo love is based on mutual, on mutual M-U-T-U-A-L, satisfaction and can feel disappointed. Then the next line says, agape is a love that has no strings attached. No strings attached. We could even ask a question like, why do you do ministry or why do you do things for God? Is it because for selfish reasons, for you could see what you get out of it? Or, or is it, God, I just love you so much, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do. You know, and when we understand that, then we're going to say, God, this, this is it. This is it. You know, I, like every third Saturday, I go to Teen Challenge. I don't get paid for that. But it's an opportunity to preach for, to the men. And, and, and in their home right now, they got 25 men from Fresno living there. You know, it's an opportunity. You know, and, and I do this stuff not because we get paid. You know, we don't get paid for pastoring the church. You know, we, we, none of that. All this is by faith. But I do it because I love the Lord. I thank God that when nobody else wanted me, when I got saved, that God stepped in and said, son, you're special. Not only you're special, you got a call of God in your life. And I took him and I believed him. And I said, God, if you couldn't use this person where my mind still runs, my flesh still acts up, God, use me. And man, I, I've always said yes since then. That's why when they said, we're going to send you out to start a church, the Lord told me to let you go. I said, fine, send me to Fresno. I'll be pioneering at 63 years old. You know, send me to Fresno. I'm fine with it. You know, I'm like, I first went and pioneered at, at, at 27, you know, and now here I find myself doing it again. But I said, God, whatever you want me to do, because it's your purpose. And when you understand that, because most of our life, we hear we got a purpose, but most of the time we fight it. God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to. Look at Gideon. He fought God's purpose. God called him, you mighty warrior. What did he say? Oh, no, I'm not. He probably looked around. Who, me? You know, and then what did he try to talk God out of the call of God? He says, God, but my tribe is the weakest. And then that didn't change God's mind. And then he says, okay, out of my tribe, I'm the weakest in my tribe. And it still didn't change God's mind. But sometimes we fight God's plan for our life. We fight God more than we fight the enemy. God, I can't do that. No, God, I don't want to do that right now. Oh, God, I don't know how to speak, God. Oh, God, I don't know how to do this, God. I don't know how to preach, God. And God is saying, you don't need to know all of that. All you got to do is say yes. And when you say yes, I'll add everything to your life. Why? Because it's my love that's going to touch them. It's my love that's going to change their life. And when we understand that, we're going to say, man, God, I, I do what I do because you gave me an opportunity to represent you. With all your power, with all your majesty, with all your anointing, with all your authority, God. You said everything I have is yours. Imagine that. Everything he has is ours. And then the handout says, it isn't looking for what it can get, but for what it can give. See, agape love doesn't look for what it can get. What can I get out of this? I'm going to do here. We're going to do this. What can I get out of this? But it's, it's, it's what it can give. Agape love is what it can give. What can it give? The house here being a lighthouse in the city, it gives hope. You see? And so when we start looking like that, you're going to look, man, you know, God, I got the opportunity to represent you. Not so much what can I get out of this, you know? Uh, but when we understand that, we're going to say, okay, God, your love. Your handout says, this is the profound love God has for the human race for he loved man when he was still lost in sin with no ability to love him back. Do you hear that? When we didn't even know how to love, God loved us. And knowing that we don't have the ability to love him back, he still loved you. He still loved me. God simply loved mankind without any thought or expectation of receiving love in return. 
And God was like, man, I love you for you being you. See, and all God asks us is just put on the new man. He doesn't want us to change ourselves. Like those that know me, man, I like to joke around. I like to have fun. And, and, and when I got saved, I tried to be somebody else. Oh, let me be like this. Let me talk King James. Hallowed be thy name. And try to talk. And God says, what are you doing? He says, be yourself. I saved you for yourself. I cannot, I cannot anoint anybody else but who I created. And so many times we want to act like somebody else. And God is saying, be yourself. I know who you are. I know your flaws. I know your weaknesses. I know your strength. And I'm going to use that. So be yourself. Then when we're ourselves, the anointing comes on our life. Amen. And we don't know why. But then we understand, God, I had nothing to do with it. All I got to do is be an open vessel to you. And when I'm open, you're able to deal with all my mess on the inside. Because too many of us, we want to worry about how we look on the outside. And God is more concerned. How do you look on the inside? You know, agape love. We're going to be real with him. Now, the next handout says part two, the fruit of the Spirit. And it talks about 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 1 through 13. And that's when the, he's talking about the gifts. He's talking about prophecy. He's talking about all this other stuff. But in the end of, of, of that, he talks about, but the greatest of these is love. <laughs> he says, when we get to heaven, we're not going to take none of the spiritual gifts. But we are going to take love, the agape love. And so on your handout, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, we find one of the most beautiful and familiar chapters in the Bible. This chapter is typically read at weddings and anniversary celebrations. It has even been set to music. <coughs> Yet this was never the original intent. Instead, Paul was writing a rebuke to a dysfunctional church for their abuse of the spiritual gifts. Then it says, Paul will urge, argue that love is an action, not an emotion. It says, this kind of love Paul will talk about is seen, experienced, and demonstrated. The agape love, it's seen, and it's experienced, and it's demonstrated. I mean, no, people can tell if you really have real love for them because they see it. You go out of your way for them. And not only that, it's demonstrated. How is it demonstrated? With action. What do I do for it? Because it's easy to love those that are lovable. What about those that are unlovable? That's where the real test is. Am I, do I have a agape love now? Because, man, they just, they get on my nerve. I mean, we have people that get on our nerve. All of us do. We got people that get on our nerves, man. And that's where God has said, okay, they get on your nerve. When you've been praying, God, teach me how to love like you. And the only way that's going to happen is when he puts us around unlovable people or people that get on our nerve. Because now he's given us an opportunity to show agape love. So if you're around people that, man, just bug you all the time, then he's setting up a platform for you to show agape love. Then it says, if love is an action, not an emotion, on your hand, if love is an action, not an emotion, we need to study what God has to say about love. We need to know what love is and what it looks like when it is lived out in the church. It says in these 13 verses, Paul provides three distinctive distinctions of love. Two observations of love. Number one, love is greater than any spiritual gift. Love is greater than any spiritual gift. It says in these three verses, Paul mentions six spiritual gifts, tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, giving, and martyrdom. It says the first four gifts are listed in chapter 12, verse 8 and 10. It says, for the one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith. And it says, to another gifts of healing, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, discerning of spirits, another kinds of diverse kind of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Your handout says, but as good as these things are, without love they do you no good. Paul declares that the greatest expression of spirituality is love. The greatest expression of spirituality is love. How do people know we're spiritual? Because we show the agape love. We show the agape love. We're able to say, man, this is God love. Because sometimes we look at other people and, and, and we want to judge them right away. And we forget that when God looks at us, he doesn't judge us right away. You know, and, and so we have to understand that. It says, we could summarize these three verses like this. 
Without love, I say nothing. Without love, I am nothing. Without love, I gain nothing. It says, stop for just a moment and reflect on your spiritual gifts and your ministry in the local church. It says, the bullet, do you do what you do out of genuine love for people? Do you do what you do out of genuine love for people? The next bullet says, do you serve out of a sense of obligation? Meaning you have to. You feel you have to. That means obligation. The third one says, do you serve because of the satisfaction you get from ministry? Oh, it makes me feel good. You get satisfaction. So the, the next one here, number two, love, ex, love is expressed by supernatural responses. Love is expressed by supernatural responses. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is very patient and kind. Never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. When's the last time we demanded our own way? Right? When we don't get our way, we have a tantrum. Well, that's it. That's it. You know, we go into our, mo our mode and we're like, man, you know. And, you see, that's what it's talking about here. It says, it is not ir irritable or touchy. Right? When we're not loving the right way, how many get irritable? How many get touchy? You're like, right? You know, want to snap at everybody around you? It says, that does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It says, hardly ever notices. In other words, the faults of people. It says, it is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Verse 7, if you love someone, you will be loyal to him, no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. That's what the love is talking about. Your handout says, love is a word that can only be properly defined in terms of action, attitude, and behavior. If we got the agape love, it's going to show in our actions. If we got the agape love, it's going to show in our attitude. If we got the agape love, it's going to show in our behavior. How many know our attitude can be seen on our face sometimes? You know, somebody asks you to do something, you don't really want to. Yeah, I'll do it. You know, I mean, it shows in our face, but it's saying here, if we have the love of God, it's not only going to show in our actions, it's going to show in our attitude. It's not only going to show in our attitude, it's going to show in our behavior. Because you can do what God asks you to do and fight all the ways. Look at the life of Jonah. God told him to go to Nineveh, preach to them, and he fought God all the ways through it. Did it get done? Yes. But he didn't do it in the right way, in the right behavior. You look at Moses, the first time when the people of Israel wanted water, he says, strike the rock. And then the second time, the Lord told Moses, speak to the rock. But Moses said, no, I know what I'm doing now. And Moses struck the rock again. Did water come out? Yes. But what happened? He didn't make it into the promised land because his behavior. He, he stopped listening to God because God is always doing new things in our life. And sometimes we get caught up in the old things and think God is going to move the same way. And God is saying, I don't move the same way. I want to put new things into your life. I got a new love for you. I got a new mindset for you. And when you understand that, it's going to show up in our behavior. It says, Paul has no room for general ideas. Instead, he wants us to know what love looks like when we see it. So Paul paints 15 separate portraits of love in the biblical definition of agape. Love acts, for love is an action, not an emotion. Verse 4 begins by summarizing the unselfish love of God. And then this one here, it says, love is patient. Love is patient. How many know patience is hard? Patience, how, how many like waiting in traffic? I don't. That's patience, you know, it's like, man, you know. It says the Greek language has several words for patience. One signifies patience with circumstances, while another is used only in reference to patience with people. It says, one signifies patience with circumstances, while another is used only in reference to patience with people. Paul seems to be saying that love doesn't have a short fuse. If you have agape love, you're not going to be short fuse. 
If you, then it says love doesn't, the next bullet, lose its temper easily. Lose its temper. How many know there's, there's certain people that they just got to say one word and right of, you, you, you lose your temper. You know, and you're like, man. And, and most of the people are the people you love. You know, and God is just saying, okay, now we're going to evaluate ourselves. And are you demonstrating the agape love? It says a person who exercises agape love does not lose patience with people. If you got agape love, you're not going to lose patience with people. Love never says, I'll give you just one more chance. That's not love. Love is patient. Loving people are willing to tolerate the shortcomings of others because they know they have faults too. I mean, you're patient with them. Yeah? You know they struggle. You don't bring calm to Look at you messed up again, man. When are you going to get it together? And man, come on already. I'm tired of telling you. No, no. Love is patient. Keep loving them in spite of what they're going through. Then the next one says love is kind. Kind. Patience must be accompanied by a positive reaction of goodness towards the other person. Kindness, however, is not to be equated with giving everyone what he or she wants. See, me, meaning that if you're kind, it doesn't mean you're going to give everybody what they want. Oh, he's a kind person. He gives, that's not what it's saying. It says sometimes love must be tough. Kindness means to withhold what harms as well as give what heals. Let me say that again. Kindness means to withhold what harms as well as gives what heals. Love is kind, but often tough. It says, Paul followed the two positive expressions of love with eight verbs that indicated how it does not behave. Then he says here, love is not jealous. If we got agape love, we're not going to get jealous of somebody else having success in their life. We're not going to get jealous when you go to church and God uses somebody else before you. I mean, if you have the agape love, you're not going to get jealous with that. And then it says, jealousy implies being displeased with the success of others. You don't rejoice with them when they have success. It says, yet true love desires the success of others. The best way to cure envy is to pray sincerely for the one who you are jealous. It says, to pray for him or her is to demonstrate love. And jealousy and love cannot exist in the same heart. Hear that. Jealousy and the agape love, they cannot exist in the same heart. Then the next one says, love does not brag. Always tooting your horn. Look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at this. Look at the Love does not brag. It says the root word for brag in Greek is closest to our English word windbag. Windbag. W-I-N-D and then bag, B-A-G. Windbag. You know how windbag just gets all puffed up? You know, that's what it's talking about. The bullet says love is not big-headed. Love is not big-headed, but big-hearted. Love is not big-headed, but big-hearted. We're talking about agape love. Then the next bullet says bragging is grasping for praise. Whenever you brag, you just want people to pat you in the back. That's bragging. That's what bragging does. You want, you want praise all the time. It says, this means the more loving you become, the less boasting you need to do. The more love of God, the more agape love that we show, the less boasting you need to do. It says, when you and I brag, we are demonstrating our insecurity. When you and I brag, we are demonstrating our insecurity and spiritual immaturity. Let me say that again. This is good right here. When you and I brag, we are demonstrating our insecurity. We don't know who we are in Christ. And it says in our spiritual immaturity. I mean, because we want the attention. Then it says, love is not arrogant. <laughs> love is not arrogant. The term arrogant refers to a grasping for power. A grasping for power. It is more serious than bragging, which is only grasping for praise. See, bragging is grasping for praise. Arrogant is grasping for power. It says arrogant people push themselves into leadership using people as stepping stones and always consider themselves exempt from the requirements. 
I mean, no, there's requirements to leadership. When you get into leadership, there's a standard we hold. Godly character talks about it in Timothy. You know, okay, the godly tenor, you got to be faithful. You know, faithful to church, faithful to church uh, events. You got to be a tither. All this stuff is, is biblical, you know, that, that we have to follow a standard because we're laying a foundation. And however we lay that foundation is going to determine how high we can build, how high we can build. And then it says arrogance disrespects others. Arrogance disrespects others. It says God calls us to serve others. And be gracious towards them. All right, we're just going to go over one more. Then we're going to close it here. It says, love does not act unbecomingly. U-N-B-E-C-O-M-I-N-G-L-E. -E. The, the word is best translated rude. Love is not rude. It says, there are some Christians who seem to take delight in being rude, and they try to justify it. And then it says, how they try to justify it? The bullet on the grounds of honesty. On the grounds of honesty. They will say, I'm just telling it like it is. But then your handout says, but love doesn't always tell it like it is. It doesn't always verbalize all its thoughts, particularly if those thoughts don't build others up. Particularly if those thoughts don't build others up. Then the next one, love does not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. It says ours is a society in which self-seeking is not only tolerated, it is even advocated. So here it says love is not possessive, the first bullet. Love is not possessive. Love is not demanding, the second bullet, demanding. The third bullet, love is not stubborn. Then the fourth bullet, love is not dominating. It says, love does not talk too much, but listens as well. It says, love does not insist on its own way. Love does not insist on its own way. It is always willing to defer to others. And we're going to stop right there. And we'll continue it next time. Next, next Wednesday. But I want to encourage us. Because even as you study this, as I study it, even as we hear it, how many know that we're still striving to love like God? doesn't matter how good we think we are. We're still striving to love more like God. And God will bring people in your life. Like I said, that you've been praying, God, help me be more like you. He says, okay, I'm going to bring those that, that you don't like, those that irritate you. I'm going to bring them around you because you've been praying for this. Now show my God love to them. Show that you really love them. You know, without judging them, without feelings, with all this stuff. Just show the real love. The way I loved you and nobody else loved you, show them the same love. So we're going to close in a word of prayer. But those watching, those are here. If you say, you know what, I, I just need prayer because I want to love more like God. We're going to say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, first of all, God, for the opportunity to teach your word. But God, we're learning about your agape love. And Lord, I pray right now, first of all, forgive us for not loving like you all the time. Forgive us, God, when the ones that irritate us come around and we don't express your love. Teach us, my God, to love like you with the agape love. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would come and strengthen our spirit, that you would encourage us, my God, knowing, God, that your love, in spite of our condition, what it is today, God, we may be far, we may be distant, we may be close, God, but whatever our condition is, God, your love will never leave us. God, I pray right now we come against the enemy that would try to bring, bring condemnation, that would try to bring discouragement right now, God. We pray your love encourages, God, that you would stir us up, God, that we would fall in love with you more and more each day, God. Teach us to love like you, God, for we can win the world for you, Father. And Lord, we're careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And everyone said, 
Amen and amen. Thank you for tuning in. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Amen.